Michael, oh, take it away. All right. Thank you very much, Mira Sensei. Um, hello, everyone. I'm uh, I'm really happy to have a chance to do this. Let me see if I can get our screen sharing going real quick, and we'll uh, we'll get it going. Let me see. Okay. I've got my laptop off to the side too, so I can see other people, and so I'm not talking into the void. Uh, anyway, okay. This. Um, this is a talk that was inspired uh, a while back. Um, I will go ahead and get started because I've got slides to cover uh, kind of introduction and getting going too. So um, this, uh, I'll go ahead and hop in, hopefully. There we go. Um, the background and goal of this presentation. So after listening to Takahashi Sensei's presentation a while back, um, I had reached out to her and had some uh, some good conversations about some of these things. Um, I thought her presentation was super helpful, really helpful in a lot of different ways because she touched on quite a lot of things that we uh, don't normally get a chance to access, which is really helpful. Um, so after writing back and forth a little bit, uh, we got some clarification on some points. And so I want to thank her for, for spurring me on to trying this. So um, um, the... Um, after after we talked for a little while, the idea came up. It would be interesting to have this uh, have a response from uh, from the Western point of view. Um, there's some points here that I've added in that I hope uh, are interesting to you. Some new, some uh, some familiar. Uh, some familiar. Oh, oh, someone is. Sorry. Okay, there was something that popped in there. Uh, sorry about that. Um, what are some of the things that uh, of note as a foreigner coming to Kudo? Uh, how do we approach things as compared to people who have grown up in Japanese society? Um, visiting this because it's a very Japanese practice. This is a, a Japanese cultural study that we're on. Um, recently, I had a chance to be a dojo manager for the first time seminar up in Vancouver. Uh, we had all had a break for a good number of years because of the pandemic. And so I got a chance to see and kind of watch overall a lot of new students coming in that perhaps hadn't had a chance to make it to a seminar before, haven't had a chance to perhaps be exposed to some of these ideas. Um, some of these things also are not quite so easy to communicate from uh, the sensei to the student. Um, I'm in a position where I'm not a sensei. I'm just, uh, I'm just a student like everyone else. And so perhaps there's an opportunity for me to present a few ideas to help bridge the gap and to bring up some ideas that aren't quite as easy for them to do. And I'll, <laughs> I'll unfold that a little bit later. Um, over the years, I've been able to be a member, uh, a resident member of many dojos. Uh, each has its own character and practice. Um, the reason, this is not necessarily a common thing, and it's not really a recommended thing either. Um, I've been, it's normal to stick with one teacher for the, at least for a good portion of your Kyoto career, if not for your entire Kyoto career. Uh, but me, for the purpose of work, I've had a chance to move around quite a lot. And that's always necessitated me to find a local dojo and to become part of that. So yeah, I always had to make sure I was moving somewhere that had Kudo. <laughs> and uh, uh, as I said before, I want to emphasize, I'm not a teacher. Uh, I'm just a student. If there are questions or doubts about any of these ideas that I bring up, uh, please bring it up with your sensei. Please let's discuss it because I'm certainly not the expert on all these sorts of things. I've just, these are things that I've observed and the way that I feel and think about things now in my keto career, but that of course changes over time. Uh, it's good to have a chance to talk about these things as I was talking about with Ed a little while ago. We've had a chance to really cover some wonderful stuff in this series. Um, a little bit about me. Um, I actually started in the Southeast. So I grew up in North Carolina and Tennessee. Huh? Um, oh, hello. Someone, uh, can you mute your, uh, your mic please? Can I, can I mute people's stuff? I don't know if I can or not. Uh, anyway, sorry, interrupted. Um, I'm, oh. Yes, Lee Ibarra, please mute. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, sorry, I don't know how to control that. Um, I, as I said, with, oh, hello? Can you please mute your microphone?
Thank you. Excellent. <laughs> Sorry, language barrier, I'm sure. Um, let me see. Uh, I, I picked up and started shooting a book really when I was a small boy. Uh, I've always had an interest in that. I've always been out in the woods uh, making my own bows and arrows as I grew up. Uh, I recently took a course with Yap for uh, making a Yumi as well, which was a really fun experience. Um, I put it all down for a while through high school, but picked up a compound again after college, um, shooting in the, the side yard after work. Um, it was a very mechanical thing, but I still remember at that point that feeling of the quiet settling before the release. I traveled to Japan for the first time in 2006. Uh, I had no idea about Kudo at this time, uh, but I really enjoyed the culture. The, the culture shock of going to Japan for the first time and really immersing in that was a really powerful experience for me. Um, I began Kudo in 2010. Uh, Rick Beal was my first uh, sensei over in Pasadena. Uh, I heard out. Uh, I heard about Kudo from Paolo Moscatelli, which some of you guys might know. He's over in Thailand these days, uh, but I owe him a really large credit, uh, uh, a large amount of gratitude for getting me started started on this. Um, I got a chance to use the very first or the same glove that Kareem Abdul Jabbar used, <laughs> which was really big. The fingers were too long and all of that, but it was enough to get me started. Um, I passed Godon in 2019 in South Carolina, and uh, I had a really lucky week and things lined up for me. I've got to admit, my, my, hands were, my hands were shaky as I was going to hand off the end to pay for things. I didn't quite believe it. Um, I'm living back in Asheville, North Carolina. And, uh, it's the mountains of Western North Carolina. So um, currently under the care of Blackwell Sensei uh, down in South Carolina. And I'm also a member of Ogoswaru under the care of Tim and Maria Senseis. Um, Tim was actually a really strong influence for me. I got a chance to see a video of him on YouTube many years ago, um, practicing Yabasame and Nico. And so it's, uh, it's really, really fun to have past cross on this, to have a chance to connect up and be a part of this as well. Blackwell Sensei said it's okay as long as they don't get it mixed up. <laughs> I've moved around a lot. Uh, this is the reason for my hopping around the world a little bit. Uh, so I, I've been bouncing around in the film and video game industry. I came back to the States to, uh, to work at uh, PlayStation in San Diego in 2018. Um, London in particular was a really strong influence for me. Having a chance to train under um, O'Brien Sensei in the London dojo there was a really formative experience for me. It was a very strict dojo, a very traditional and formal dojo. And so I got a chance to learn quite a lot of the specifics of how you should act, how you should carry yourself, and how you can integrate successfully into dojos over in Japan. So these are some of the different teachers that I've uh, I've been really lucky to have a chance with. Starting uh, top left corner, there's Rick Beal. Uh, in the middle, that was in Gardena under Doug Sensei. Doc is there. Uh, Sato and Andy as well, good group of people. To the right is O'Brien Sensei. That was my last practice uh, there in London. Uh, lower left is Vancouver with uh, Mike and Moto. Uh, lower center is uh, with Jeanette Sensei. She was helping me prepare for, for a demo. So uh, I was the lucky winner who got to stand up and shoot for that. Uh, and lastly is Blackwell Sensei in the lower right hand corner. I actually met uh, Blackwell Sensei in Vancouver. He came up to teach there, or still does. And so that was the first time I'd had a chance to meet him. And so I'm really fortunate to have a chance to be back close uh, close to home where I can go and visit with him. Um, why, are, why are we interested in Kudo? Why are we drawn to it? Um, this is a common question on the showdown, uh, showdown's written exam. Um, for me, it's like I've always practiced archery in other forms. Um, the um, trying different types of things, shooting as a lefty here, because I'm left-handed, have to switch over and do right-handed for Kudo, which is an interesting wrinkle. O'Brien Sensei cautioned me on this, and he said, well, you really shouldn't be crossing the streams. Um, these days, I only shoot a Yumi, so I still have the English Longbows, but the Yumi is uh, the one I'd lean towards. Uh, I practiced some martial arts in the past, some Tai Chi and Hungar, a bit of Zen, and other forms of meditation as well. I've always really been drawn to internal practice, and this is something that I have been able to find and connect with uh, in Kudo as well. Being a little bit more quiet and introverted, 
this is a natural match for me in Kudo. Kudo is a good expression of that. Um, I've enjoyed Japanese culture uh, in a lot of ways. Food for me is entertainment. And as we've all experienced, hopefully, the chance to go and have some of the really good stuff over in Japan. Uh, the artfulness in society there really uh, draws me in as well. It's something that resonates the attention to the fine details. Kudo definitely uh, scratches that itch for me. And lastly, and we'll get on to the real stuff here in a second, is um, the, the artfulness of the practice of Kudo, um, the aesthetics. Having a chance to watch an advanced practitioner perform the same movements that I'm trying to learn uh, is really something to help push you along. Uh, to watch and listen, um, the quiet movements and the careful control is something I think we all appreciate. Um, the strength of things, the dignity and the expression of the shooting. And so having a chance to study under someone like O'Brien Sensei was uh, uh, was a really, really instructive, really powerful experience for me. I'm grateful to have had the chance. Um, moving along, we're going to begin at the beginning. Uh, this was this is my glove when I first got it, when it was all clean. Uh, I didn't take a photo of uh, my current one to compare, but it's nothing. it looks nothing like this anymore, that's for sure. Um, being taught Kudo, um, Kudo, I've always been told, a black well sensei has, uh, has always told me Kudo should be fun. Uh, it can be a little bit scary sometimes, but when you, uh, when you first place yourself inside the bow, uh, to trust that, that process, we always worry about, is the string going to hit me? Is the string going to take my ear off? It's, uh, it's been done like this for many hundreds of years though. So trusting the process and settling into it, um, being willing to learn is a really important thing. How you approach the practice, how you come to uh, to being taught is really important. Uh, Rick always told me that our body already knows how to do Kudo. You just have to get your brain out of the way. Um, there are lots of things that will feel unfamiliar to you as you, uh, as you move into it. Uh, as we all know, it's like we're using new muscles. Uh, the sitting and standing is something that is foreign to us. Uh, opening the bow and trusting the expansion, and trusting the form. Um, all in all, come to the dojo with an open and cooperative mind. It's like it's something if you resist it, it's going to resist back. And so being open to being moved around and positioned to being shown how these things should feel and move is super, super important. Uh, we're really lucky. We're getting the chance to try something that's quite unique. And that's me personally. That's something I'm grateful for every time I can show up. Um, receiving the teaching, um, being willing to learn. Um, I think we've all seen students perhaps who, who are resistant to things like, oh, I can't do that, or I'm scared to do this or that. Um, being open to trying, being open to the instruction to allow yourself to be moved in the right way and positioned is something that's really important. Um, learning how to listen and hear fully, slowing down and receiving the information, having time to think about what's being said to you, uh, write it down. In years to come, you'll understand things in a new light in different ways. I, I go back and look at my old notebooks and find notes that I'd made a long time ago. And these are things you can stop and think about in a different sort of way. Um, don't be afraid to try things that seem unfamiliar or illogical. There's an aspect of Kudo that doesn't necessarily rely on, uh, on, on conscious, logical understanding. Some of the things that we are learning, some of the things that we're doing can be felt and understood in the body instead of in the mind with logical thought. And learning how to kind of switch off and let your body do things instead of always relying on your mind to do things is important. Um, if you're worried about it, if you're concerned, don't worry in that you know, your, your sensei won't give you something to do that all of us haven't been asked to do before. So when we watch younger students go through this, we all recognize that struggle and we identify that and we're here to support you on that. Make sure you write things down. It's These days, it's really common to take notes on your phone, uh, to do it in other ways, but the, honestly, this is one of the most important things you can do in your practice. Part of the learning process is storing things away in your memory to be able to first get it into your mind and, and keep it there, and then also transfer it into your body. And so 
memory is a fallible thing. And if you don't write things down, things will go away and you can't rely upon that to, to retain it. Um, don't do it on your phone, do it, pen, put pen to paper, get a nice notebook being, I mean, if you watch Shade at seminars, it's like after uh, the participants finish the shooting, they come back and sit before the Hanshi. Invariably, they're going to have their notebook and their pen with them. It's uh, it's a matter of, I actually did a, a little searching on this just to back it up. Like psychology today is uh, uh, jotting things down on paper is much faster. Handwritten notes tend to be more accurate and have a personalized flair. Um, handwriting in a notebook triggers more robust brain activity and writing by hand is associated with stronger neural encoding and memory retrieval. So the, the value of doing that beyond these superficial or not superficial, but these uh, initial things is also that you have a record of where you've been, what you touched in each practice, a little jot. Uh, down in the notebook after each practice is, is important to be able to keep track of your own progress with things. How were you feeling last week? What types of things were you looking at? What was working? What wasn't working? Um, this is also really important to allow you to record dates. Um, so some of the important things that we keep track of is what's the date that you started studying Kudo? Which seminars have you been to? When and where? Um, who is your current teacher? Who's the, who are the teachers that you've studied under? All of this information will be necessary you know, when you go fill out Shinsa applications. And so I have all of mine on the inside cover on the front so I can easily access along with my ID number and things like that. Probably have three or four notebooks by now. Just the collection of things to be able to have the chance to go back and look is super important. Um, there's also the... The projection of what this says when you're sitting down and writing. Uh, if you visit over in a dojo in Japan, being able to have them see that you're taking notes is a compliment to them. Um, the value of what you're learning is really super important and is quite rare. And to demonstrate by writing things down that you also understand the importance of this is something that is really valuable and it speaks volumes to them too. Uh, my friend over in Japan mentioned this to me and he was saying he was very impressed. And so this information is, I can't say that enough, is really precious in every little tidbit, especially the farther along that you go, it becomes that much more important. Um, <laughs> there's only uh, the only right answer. <laughs> When you're being uh, when you're being taught, when you're being addressed and given notes and comments, um, for many of us, when we're given feedback, our natural instinct is our brain is racing ahead. Especially if you're given something, we're like, "Oh, you did this wrong, or you did that wrong." Not that they would say you did things wrong, but our natural inclination is to respond to that and say, "Oh, I just you justify it by saying this is what I was trying to do. This is what I was thinking about doing." It's, it's important to stop and just listen. Learning how to listen, learning how to hear, to fully grasp what's being given to you is one of those things that takes a good amount of practice. Um, is in response to, to notes and stuff, and that, that impulse we all have to respond and say, um, oh, this is why I did this, stop and think is, are your answers more important than what Sensei is trying to tell you? Sensei is jumping around the room talking to a lot of different people. and He's giving uh, feedback, sometimes to many, many people, depending on the size of the dojo. If you're at seminar, ask, ask Blackwell Sensei how many students he had in this last uh, seminar and how much time he had for each individual person. So uh, um, it's important to, to listen and to process before you try to speak about, uh, back about things. Of course, you can ask questions and clarification. That's a natural part of things and that's totally legit. Uh, but consider Sensei's bandwidth and, uh, and what he's doing, what he's, she, he or she, excuse me, um, and make sure that you're receiving before you're trying to say something back. Uh, what's the right answer to a comment? It's like, hi, yes, or thank you. So uh, that will suffice. Um, <laughs> one of uh, Blackwell Sensei's favorite sayings is uh, uh, "is relax, no relax harder." So um, 
trust your sensei. Um, your sensei is doing this for the love of Kudo. They're doing it to help our community expand and grow because Kudo is something that is precious and worth maintaining. Each person in the dojo learns and grows differently. And, and you know, senseis understand this. They've been through the process. They've seen a lot of students come through. Perhaps a certain way of teaching will uh, will be tried out first, and then adjustments will be made as you progress. And so um, some things might work for some students and not others. Um, they might get you to move in different directions to see how you respond and see how things work with your particular mind and body. Allow them to experiment with you and apply these understandings. They might say things to make you think about things a little bit differently and challenge you a little bit. Um, I, it's just a just a month or two back, Mike uh, Blackwell sensei was telling me, Michael, you need to be hitting more. Um, and uh, just a few minutes later after that, he said, stop trying to hit the target so much. And so the, the different angles of things and it's like the ways that you come at stuff, it's like, oh, what's the balance? And so, but allow yourself to uh, to be moved around, to, posi to be positioned and let sensei try things. Um, uh, O'Brien sensei told me one time, um, why should I spend time on someone who is not trying? There are other students I can spend time on. Each thing that you're given, each note that you're offered is, you know, if you're given suggestions, like try this, do this, it's a valid thing that you should take seriously and do your best to implement. Because if you refuse to do these things, if you're not able to do things, that's a different thing than, um, uh, than refusing. Um, why should sensei spend time with you if you simply don't try to do things? And so why are you here? What's your purpose of studying Kudo? So the interdependence of things is important. So there's, uh, this is a whole thing you can talk about. Um, all of this isn't trivial, but it can be discussed in length. But just remember that you're be given, being given an opportunity to learn something that's super rare in this country. Natori Geiko. Uh, learn by watching. Um, just as with the listening, <clears throat> excuse me, learning by watching is a skill that you must practice as well. Um, I think, you know, we all think, oh, I can watch, I can see, but there's a bit of an art to that as well that takes a bit of practice. I feel I've gotten a little bit better understanding um, in the, just in the last year or two. Um, Blackwell Sensei asked me to pick one Hanshi to study. I think this is a pretty common thing for everyone. Mine is Ishi Sensei. Um, how do I study that? I, started, I was thinking, I was wondering, what do I focus on? Just generally studying a hanshi. So how do you break that down? Uh, lost my note. Um, the next week I came back and he asked me if I'd looked at it. And I said, yes, I looked at it. And go, what did you see? And I was like, well, I had difficulty really putting things into words very specifically. Um, so he pointed out uh, Toriyaf uh, to me. It's like, he said, look how steady his arrow is. Uh, when he is, uh, he's coming to take uh, the uh, the Otoya. Uh, does it bounce around like yours? And I was like, hmm, I hadn't really thought about that before. How of, how often do you do you have something pointed out to you in the dojo that you really haven't even thought of before? Um, this week, um, or the, the following week, he told me, it's like, oh, just watch the feet on entering. Uh, is the heel coming off the floor? Look how the big toe comes into contact with the left heel before stepping uh, forwards towards the camisa. What does yours look like? Um, why are you leaning forward when taking that first step in? You should be standing straight and expanding upward. Enter with a strong presence and confidence. Move from the koshi and you won't lean forward. Watch it again and tell me what you see next week. While you're waiting to uh, for your turn to shoot at uh, seminars or even just in the dojo, watch and see what sensei is telling others. Is it a little different from how it was presented to you? Hearing and seeing things presented in a different way will help you understand the subtle nuances of things, being able to hear things from different directions. Oh, I just realized it didn't subtitles. Check it out, subtitles. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so... Um, watch, but also listen. Uh, a big part of understanding and observing is the listening. Um, I have a recording I made at the Red Dead Dojo a few years ago. Uh, I placed a stereo mic about halfway down the Yamichi. Uh, it's easy to tell the level of skill of Ite, the various Ite who are shooting. Um, listen to how the arrow uh, strikes the target. Is it a center hit or an edged hit? 
that's an easy one to hear the difference between. It's like striking a drum on the edge or in the middle. Um, or did it just miss off to the side and hit the sand instead or the foam? How did the uh, how did the arrow penetrate the target? Was it clean and crisp? Did it go straight through, or was the arrow flying at slightly a different angle? And you can hear the paper tearing as it goes through. Was it a solid hit, or did it just barely make it? All of these things tell you something about your release without even having to look down at the target. Uh, listen to your surene. Is it clean and crisp, or is it messy and muddled? This also tells you a lot about what's happening during your release. That's something in particular that uh, that I've been asked to focus on myself. And so getting the fine tuning of your balance in your right hand, how clean and how crisp, where is your release coming from? All of these things you can get some information from just by listening. So learn by watching, learn by listening, fine tune, fine tune your awareness in and out of the dojo. This is something you can practice outside the dojo as well. Um, the hierarchy of the dojo. Um, this is an interesting thing. There are differences in how hierarchy is handled in Japanese culture versus in American or Western culture. Um, who is your sensei? <laughs> this is one of those things that is, I think there was some hesitation to talk about some of these things before because the approach is really uh, different in a traditional Japanese dojo. The relationship of you to your teacher is uh, is is a different sort of thing. Um, there's something from Confucius where roughly translated, it's like teachers should be teachers and students should be students. Um, so keeping that hierarchy in place and that correct teacher-student relationship is one of those things that is important, especially the higher up that you go. Um, this, you know, when I, this is something that O'Brien Sensei mentioned to me, and it's a tricky one because when I first heard it, it was, I found it really shocking. And so we were having a, we were, we often would go to the pint uh, or go to the pub and have a pint afterwards with a couple of people. But uh, he told me, is like, your teacher is not your friend. And that's when, you know, hearing that, especially as an American, I think that's a shocking thing. Um, it's not a malicious sort of thing, it's more about, your teacher can uh, can certainly be friendly, but it's important. There's there's a bit of a distinction to maintain the correct uh, relationship between the teacher and the student in a more strict sense. Uh, in America, we're very casual about these things. Everything is horizontal. Everyone is uh, is kind of on the same playing field. It's easy to relax. So uh, we all want to be liked. We all want to be friends. Um, Kudo can very much be a social thing for us, and it can be a social thing in Japan too, of course. But it's it's a little bit of a different thing, a, a little bit of a nuance sort of thing. So uh, as we progress in rank and we begin to walk a bit more serious path, it can shift a bit. The traditional Japanese teacher-student relationship is more structured, and you maintain that level of respect for the position of the teacher and having that, that connection, that relationship allows you as the student to more easily receive teaching from your teacher. Because if you think about it, it's like we have our friends and if someone gives you something and go, oh, I don't think that's a good idea. But in this particular situation, you need to be able to receive teaching from the sensei and receive it without question. And so it's... This is one of those things you could talk about for quite a while. I should probably have a pint to do it. But um, anyway, I just wanted to bring that one up. But um, the, a big portion of this also, maintaining the balance of the relationship, letting go of your own personal ego and allowing things to happen and receive teaching from your sensei is very important. Um, a subtle distinction, or not, not so subtle, is recognize that non-Japanese teachers are just as valid as Japanese teachers. And so the experience might be subtly different, but this is really balanced out. You should feel quite lucky that you can have someone teach you within the cultural structure that you're used to, uh, the cultural filter that we've all grown up with. Uh, much of the thought and practice um, has been done and has been worked through 
they can translate not just the words, but also the intent of things and how to best relate to those as a Westerner, perhaps compared to a Japanese person. Um, what is expected of Kohai? So as a younger student, as a beginner, Kido is a really wonderful thing. It's um, There's not much pressure. The expectations are quite modest for you. Um, realize that you're learning something that is a lifelong study. Uh, it's not a race and it's uh, different people learn in different ways. Uh, your sensei knows this and understands this and will help guide you along. Everyone here, everyone at uh, seminar, when you're watching Shinsa, we all want you to succeed. There isn't that sense of competition uh, of the race to be ahead of other people. Um, do your best, uh, listen well and watch well. Uh, show and demonstrate that you're trying to apply the things that you've been shown. Um, one of the uh, the good things about, I guess, uh, having more people in the dojo, the cleaning and the setup goes much faster. A big portion of the responsibility is to be able to have the uh, the extra hands and the extra extra manpower for setting things up and for cleaning. Um, you want to learn how to shoot the bow, but realize that the basics, the kihontai, are really, really important. The walking, the turning, sitting, breathing, and bowing. All of these things may seem trivial trivial at first, but they really are the cornerstone of our practice. I'm sure you've all heard this before, but to hear it reiterated, uh, Ogasawara Sensei, this is whenever you're feeling stressed, when you're not, when you're losing touch with your practice, he is very strongly oriented towards going back to the basics, uh, learning, connecting with your breath, learning how to move from the core and how to move correctly. Whenever you're losing con uh, touch with your practice, go back and reconnect. These very basic things, uh, we talk about going back to the beginning. These are one of those things that uh, this is a true expression of that. Um, as, a, uh, as a beginner student, as Kohai, you won't always have direct access to your sensei, especially if you're in a larger, uh, larger dojo. Uh, this is particularly um, the case in larger dojos over in Japan. Um, in this situation, your senpai is teaching you things or directing you to do something that uh, sensei wants, uh, uh, wants conveyed. Um, please listen to your senpai as if it's a direction that's coming uh, right from your sensei. Um, sensei is, uh, has, uh, has trained the senpai and is relying on them to guide you and to help keep the dojo organized and running well. Um, how does senpai fit in the picture? Um, this is something I've spent a good amount of time thinking about a little bit more uh, recently as well. Um, passing a grade isn't so much a thing as where you're given the rank and then you're done. It's more about the acknowledgement that they think you have the potential to, uh, to grow into this role. Uh, I was, of course, really happy to pass uh, the grade but I've done a lot of thinking about it afterwards, uh, realizing the the responsibility of uh, of this role, this position. Um, it's really a, a duty to to help carry some of the weight and to help support and build uh, our community uh, here in the West. Um, as you progress, the rank is uh, as you progress in the rank, the more is expected of you. Uh, in most dojos, the idea that you've been practicing for a longer time and uh, or the idea is that you have been practicing for a longer time and you'll carry more responsibility. Um, this is this is more evident in the logical progression of things. Uh, is it, ex it is expected you'll understand more. Your responsibilities will be greater. Sensei has invested a large amount of time and energy bringing you along. As you progress, it's necessary for you to be mindful of this and support Sensei as needed. Uh, this, this is a core concept is like, especially the more you progress, you are there to support your sensei. It's one person can't run a dojo all by, the, uh, by themselves. It's a tremendous amount of work. And so being there to help support the structure of things is really vital. Uh, as senpai, you are an example uh, for the kohai to observe uh, how you act, how you should, uh, how, how should a dojo operate? Um, we're there to help set a good example of how things should be done. Uh, because of this, we should always be watching and learning ourselves, uh, always refining and strengthening our behavior and skills to the best of our ability. Um, 
senpai can be called on to teach beginners or to assist in teaching, especially in larger dojos, maybe the sensei, uh, they don't have enough time to fully engage with all of the students. Uh, in, in Japan, it's, uh, it would be a bit more rare to have direct access to the sensei. Uh, beginners are often taught by the senpai. Um, it's just like in Japan, it's quite rare to have access to Hanshi. And so this is something that we're very lucky to be able to have access to in the West. The fact that we go to seminars and have Hanshi, the very highest level uh, teachers and masters to be able to teach us is something that is unbelievable and just the, so fortunate. Um, in um, in the case where uh, senpai might be called to assist or to teach a bit, uh, in this case, they must be sure to teach what the sensei would teach, to not get off track on their own thoughts and feelings quite as much, but to make sure that we are to, there to act as a channel to help assist sensei and to convey the ideas. Um, in case where uh, senpai is a little unsure about what they're teaching, it's always important to go back and uh, clarify with sensei to make sure what you're teaching is consistent. Uh, as senpai, we get to be the demonstration models. <laughs> During the spring seminar at Blackwell Sensei's, I was uh, called on to demonstrate certain things while uh, Sensei talked uh, talked about the various points. Uh, how long can you sit correctly and maintain good Toriyumi no Shisei? Uh, you'll get to find out. Um, uh, feel lucky to have the chance to be useful and assist those who have poured so much time and energy into you. Uh, let me see. Things are best coming in. Uh, sorry, I'm going through my notes here too. <laughs> oh, um, make sure you don't teach unless sensei asks you to teach. I think that's another one of those things in the West where we're very, we're proud of what we've learned. We want to, sh uh, we want to share that sometimes. When you're watching someone else shooting, it's very easy to go and say, oh, you should do this or you should do that. That's a no bueno thing. It's like, as long as there's sensei in the, uh, in the dojo, everything should be channeled through them. Um, learning this balance is difficult. It takes some time and uh, ask your sensei about what kind of balance uh, they would like to see in the dojo, uh, speaking as, uh, uh, as senpai. Um, this has been different in different dojos for me. Uh, Vancouver, I ended up uh, teaching quite a lot. Uh, we shared a lot of these, uh, uh, these tasks and duties. Uh, some of this in San Diego as well. Uh, with Blackwell sensei, it's rare. I mean, obviously, you know, being seventh on Kyoshi. It's like, oof, I don't have anything to add to that. I am there to listen. Uh, and there's also Reiko Sensei, of, uh, of course, as well. And so between the two of them, I'm very happy to be able to sit and have the opportunity to, to observe, to watch and learn. I was helping to do a video recording at Redwood uh, Dojo, uh, like a, uh, gosh, like a year or two back, perhaps a bit more. Um, I made the mistake of offering direction to someone uh, while I was, uh, while I was filming. Uh, the art director part of my brain was uh, was was jumping in there and driving. Um, this was pointed out to me, and I uh, and I quickly apologized. I was uh, I had stepped over that line. Sometimes those lines are a little bit unclear. So I wasn't teaching in the dojo. We were doing some recording. I thought, "Ooh, let's do this and this." And it's like, "Oh, that's not the appropriate thing." Uh, I'm 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 really happy to be have these sorts of corrections pointed out to me because it helps clarify the situations that perhaps it's not black or white, how should we act? And so to have Sensei step in and tell you these sorts of things, it's really helpful and gives you a better understanding. Um, oh, remember one of the points that Takahashi Sensei uh, had brought up was, remember that um, trust once lost is very difficult to regain. So keeping your ego out of it as much as possible, learning how to set yourself aside and be a conduit for Sensei is really important skill to work on. Oh, cup of tea. <clears throat> Americans, why are, why are they, why are we so loud? <laughs> the idea of what is common and true can be different in, uh, in different countries. Uh, as an outsider trying to learn these different ways, it's important to keep an open mind and to be flexible. Um, through my work, I uh, work with people from a lot of different countries and I've had the opportunity to see lots of different communication styles from lots of different countries. Uh, this is, there's no different, it's not that large of a difference here. We're focused very much on Japanese culture and our study is there. Um, I, I was finishing up some work in New Zealand. I had spent a month traveling on the South Island because I had done 
gosh, three months of like 80 hour weeks. And then um, it was really quiet down there. And then I went and spent a few weeks in Japan before coming back to LA. Uh, I remember standing in line at, uh, at one of the, uh, 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 one of the restaurants getting some food. And I remember the idea crossing my mind is like, why is this guy yelling his order to the person behind the counter? Um, the reverse culture shock is a real thing coming back to the States. And it took me a little while to readjust. Uh, everything is quite loud in America. And so I go to a deli in New York at lunch, for instance. And uh, you, ha you have to get away from this to really come back and realize. Uh, in, J in Japan, be aware of the different levels of these sorts of things. Listen and be aware how everyone around you is acting. How are they reacting to you? Get a, learn how to read the room and see there's a difference. It's not bad. There's a difference. <laughs> we have our own strengths and weaknesses, don't we? Um, there's a term that I ran across years ago, and, and uh, I, I do hope I'm using this correctly, but um, the, I, I, I looked it up, kikobari. I've learned, uh, or I, I looked this up, and it was like, from a time children are very small, they're taught by their parents to think about, to be considerate of, and not inconvenience others. Um, this is instilled by teachers and sustained by colleagues and supervisors in the workplace. It's an integral part of being Japanese and is captured in the Japanese word kikobari, which is a combination of ki, meaning spirit, mood, or atmosphere, and the verb kubaru, meaning to distribute or spread around. Pay attention and be aware of your surroundings. Awareness of the impact that you're having on those around you is really important. Think about riding the train and how everyone is very quiet. Everyone is very aware of the space around them, even when they're super crowded in at rush hour. Um, are you being noisy? Are you crowding over into someone else's space? Being aware of the space and the closeness of you to someone else and the impact that that can have. As Americans, we're not so sensitive to this because everything is a little bit louder. If you bump into someone, it's not a big deal. Or if you stand closer, it's not so uh, not so different either. But uh, and it's being aware of how things are in different spaces and watching is super, super important. Another part of this is anticipating the needs of others, filling these gaps proactively. This is something that's a lot more commonly inherent in Japanese culture. Um, these things definitely transfer into our kudo practice, sensitivity to the group, the impact that you're having on those around you, the timing, the harmony of the group, something to think about. Um, if you're 15 minutes early, you're late. <laughs> I like being on time. It doesn't always happen. Uh, perhaps this is an extension of the kikobari, but being prompt, being early even, is a sign of respect for those around you in Japan. If you show up late, it means they will have to wait on you. It broadcasts that you are not concerned about their needs over your own. Um, we've all made mistakes and taken the wrong train. Perhaps you accidentally get the local train instead of the express train or uh, while you're traveling through Tokyo. If it's important, if it's really important, I will go extra early or even go and scout out the route that, uh, the day before. Just making sure that you can be there is really important to be there at the right time, to be there ahead of time. Um, be able to be there waiting when your sensei arrives shows respect and lets them know you consider this meeting or this practice to be important. Uh, bonus point, if you help to carry sensei's things into the dojo. <laughs> so anyway, always take care of your sensei. Um, let me see. If you've got time to lean, you've got time to clean. I worked in the restaurant business. Um, cleanliness is something that is more ingrained in Japanese culture. Not everybody's clean. It's natural. There's different types of people. But there is um, a connection to Shinto, the practice of purification. Uh, the dojo should be clean before practice, even if it's just wiping down the floors with a dust mop. Uh, cleaning and maintaining the dojo equipment. Has, uh, has it been cleaned once already? No, oh, it's okay. Clean it again, just to be sure. Uh, what are the areas that someone might have missed? That's the stopping and looking and thinking and just working your way through it in your own mind. Um, take care of things that you think might have been uh, overlooked. Um, it was described to me once uh, that the process of cleaning the dojo is a vehicle of transition from the outside world and into the dojo. It gives you the time to set your mind and to set your intent for the coming practice. Let go of the worries of the day. Concentrate on what is in front of you, what is here, what is now. Um, 
there's a very good video that was put out recently. You probably all have seen this. Miyako Sensei. It's all of the uh, uh, videos for beginning people beginning Kyudo. Um, this one was called The Dignity of Dress. Um, keeping yourself clean and well-groomed. Uh, your clothes cleaned and pressed. It's super important. Learning how to wear your hakaman dogi correctly is very important. It's an evolutionary sort of thing. You start and you learn refinements as you go along from mudan up through the higher ranks. Um, if you're a bit of a rumpled mess, your practice will be influenced by this, as will the perceptions that others have of you. So clean, cleanliness and tidiness. Um, visiting dojos in Japan. Um, let me see, we're up to 36 out of 45. We're moving, okay. Um, one of the beautiful things about getting connected to this community of ours is the chance to experience Japan at a deeper level, uh, beyond just being a tourist. Kyoto is something that isn't visible or isn't as visible to people, even in Japan. The fact that we have that connection, that we can participate in this cultural study is a really special opportunity. Uh, we get to watch, participate, and understand at a much deeper level. I know a guy. <laughs> so while I was in Vancouver, I got a chance to meet uh, Harima Sensei here. Uh, we, of course, we can't just show up at a dojo and hope to take part. It's like when you first go to watch Kudo. Uh, they're not going to let you in and uh, uh, just pick up a bow without the correct introduction. Um, introductions are, are, are necessary. You need an in. So Harima Sensei and Inagawa san in this photo. I've been good friends for, uh, for several years now. Um, uh, Harima Sensei came to uh, to study English in uh, Vancouver for a few months and came to the dojo there to practice. And, you know, sometimes you see people and they just instantly connect. And it's like, oh, you and I are going to be friends. And uh, it has been that way. So he's been such an incredible enabler for me, uh, taking the time to show me places and things, uh, teaching me about things that I hadn't known before, uh, test <laughs> testing my culinary limits in Japanese food, too. Um, through such connections, we're able to see how Kudo is practiced there in Japan. Um, you're a bit of a distraction to the normal flow. Uh, realize that if you're visiting a dojo in Japan, you may be a bit of a distraction for them. Um, not, not, not always, not necessarily in a bad way. They will do their best to take care of you, but realize your presence is, uh, is, is perhaps keeping them from their regular methods of practice. Um, they're, of course, very happy to teach and take care of you, but uh, realize there's a pull in different directions sometimes. Be sensitive to this. Do what you can to step into the flow of things. Uh, make sure that you can do your best to mesh with everyone else. Um, when you first go to a new dojo, there's a good chance Sensei will not engage with you right away. Uh, no doubt you'll be introduced. Uh, you'll be asked to demonstrate your shooting for them, I'm, I'm sure. More than likely, it's at the Makiwara first. And after a few shots, you might then be allowed to join in with the others in rotation of the regular shooting. Each dojo is different, but uh, be aware that you're working your way in through the layers. Uh, the first time I'm in the London dojo, I shot without feedback for quite some time. Uh, I was used to Rick Beale's approach, uh, always having each shot supervised. Um, I remember wondering if Sensei would come pay attention to me at some point. In time, they always will. Um, once when I was shooting, uh, uh, I was at the stage of sorting out the correct draw length for my shooting. Uh, I would often overdraw. I was working towards what I thought was Kai at the time. O'Brien Sensei called out in a loud voice from across the room shouting, stop. <laughs> so he was telling me to stop my shooting because I was at risk of overdrawing to the point where the tip of my arrow would come around behind the back of my bow. Um, sensei might not be watching you directly, but they're keeping an eye on you, you can be sure. Oh, not being able to speak Japanese. I don't really speak Japanese. Um, it's more challenging to be sure, but odds are someone in a dojo uh, will understand a little bit of English. And uh, Google Translate also is a tremendous help these days. Uh, as someone who's traveled around a bit, uh, it's, it's amazing how much communication is nonverbal. Realize that you might not be able to fully take part if this is the case. Um, the members of the dojo might feel a little bit of extra stress because of this. Each dojo is different, of course, but uh, to accommodate, pay attention carefully. Uh, watch for all the nonverbal cues you might get from the people around you. Uh, as Maria Sensei said, put your antenna fully out. Uh, learn, to learn to read the room. Um, 
<laughs> let's watch the tall gaijin. Uh, if you're an introvert like me, this can be a little bit intimidating. Um, you will be observed. Uh, I was able to take part in a, a local Taikai competition at Ota uh, years ago, uh, 90, 9 a.m. in the morning the next day after I'd uh, uh, my flight had arrived. Uh, there was a video crew there to cover it from the local TV station, not, not because of me, but just their uh, lo regular local coverage. And they put me right up front in the middle. So uh, <laughs> it's a curiosity for them to have a foreigner taking part in Kudo. Why do you want to learn Kudo? Do you like visiting Japan? Is this your first time? Do you enjoy Japanese food? <laughs> uh, a close friend of mine took me to her favorite stand-up sushi bar. Taisho asked me if I can eat everything okay. And she said, uh, yes, he eats everything. Uh, he asked about monkfish liver. And I said, sure, let's give it a try. He served it to me and I could feel them watching and crouching down to see if, uh, see if I would eat it and enjoy it. Uh, they smiled and laughed after I gave them the thumbs up. Um, let me see. Um, you are a representation of all those back home. Uh, as Takahashi Sensei uh, said in her presentation, remember that you are a representative of the Kudo community outside Japan. Um, you are paving the way for those who will follow after you. If you leave them with a good impression, it will go much easier for everyone following you. Uh, clean, well-pressed uniform is important. Good manners and listening well is important. All of these things that I've touched on. Learn to fit in as best you can. Um, <laughs> a pro tip if you're tall like me longer arrows go in the back of the arrow box um make sure you're not getting in the way of others if possible um let me see let's get that one um our responsibilities going forward we are the future of kudo in our countries and out in the world um this is, uh, let me see, I'll get his name, Hiroyasu uh, Hisada-sensei. He's an uh, eighth Don Hanshi. Uh, this was in a small seminar in the UK years ago. His father was also Hanshi. Uh, when this photo was taken, he had been practicing over 60 years already. Um, I was testing for Sondon at the time, and, uh, which I ended up failing. <laughs> so uh, we were practicing entering the dojo during the regular seminar. Uh, we were all making lots of mistakes, of course, doing it over and over. Um, he spoke of the importance of learning this well. He told us we were the future of Kudo and that we must learn this correctly to keep Kudo alive in the future. Um, I don't know if this is the correct translation, but it was something to the effect of if you don't learn it correctly, Kudo will die. <laughs> and uh, that kind of is like, wow, that's kind of crazy, man, but uh, it's heavy. But I, it, it stuck with me and it's influenced me. I remember that feeling when I heard that. Uh, understanding that we all must do what we can to keep things true to Kudo as it is practiced in Japan. Um, I mentioned uh, that I was tapped to be dojo manager a while back. Uh, it was an opportunity for me to learn more things to how things should be run, to help out taking care of our community. Um, it was hard work, but I was really happy to be given a chance to do it. Um, I worked with Mike and Linda and uh, under the eyes of all of our sensei, <laughs> we, we, we did what we can to make everything happen. Much to learn still, of course, but I'm really happy I was given the chance to try. Um, our teachers won't be around forever. Uh, the responsibility will be on our, on our shoulders at some point. Honda sensei passed away uh, several years ago. O'Brien sensei passed away. Um, other teachers, as they get older, after 80 years old, Hanshi can't, uh, can no longer travel for seminars. Um, always take care of your, <laughs> always take care of your sensei. Um, Kudo means a lot to me and I hope it means a lot to you as well. Uh, help us learn and share to keep Kudo growing out in the world. Uh, pass this art along to those who follow in your footsteps and help where you can. Remember to have fun with practice, but folk, uh, but practice with focus and sincerity. Learn well and remember those who have come before. Thank you. That's about it. So I will go ahead and unshare if I can find that button. Thank you, Michael. Excellent presentation. A lot of insightful ah, comments you. there. I think there's a lot of stuff and I kind of went through too little fast. I hope I hope it wasn't too fast. <laughs> yeah, we're really close to the top of the hour when we're gonna hmm. have to stop, but if there's okay. a couple of pressing questions, we could take them. Anything in the chat? We'll check the chat just a sec. Hmm. 
comment from Rosemary, who has found the series of lectures to be wonderful. Thank you very much. This has been something that we started during COVID as a way to stay in touch at a time when we couldn't. So we've decided to continue it for a good couple of years now. So yeah, let's see. Uh, Marianne shared, Michael, thanks for sharing your experiences and suggestions. Uh, Keto in South America is facing many challenges. It, it, it's at an mm. early stage of development. This format has helped us to sort of fill in some gaps, complementing some things they know. Thanks for that. A lot of thank yous to Michael you. from Uruguay, Argentina, Paraguay. Mexico, everybody. <laughs> All right. So unless there's a pressing question from anyone, we're going to have to end this. And this will be the conclusion of the AKR Forum series, unless, as Jeremy had mentioned at the top, uh, unless there's something pressing that, or someone who wants to take over the management of the series. <laughs> anyway, yes. thanks, everyone, for joining. And thank you so much, Michael, for your valuable and interesting presentation. I think everybody enjoyed it. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. Hey. Bye, everybody.